Good morning. I'm Diana Pullman, Executive Director of Pandas Network. We're a nonprofit representing families from around the world. Welcome to the Common Threads Post-Infectious Autoimmune Diseases of the Brain Conference for Medical Professionals. The event was sponsored together with our other national nonprofit affiliates from the southeast of the US, Midwest, East Coast, Northeast, Texas, and Canada. I wanted to acknowledge also Pandas Physicians Network, who sponsored your CME and the nurses' credits also today. This is a nonprofit to inform medical community about research trends in pandas and pans. Also, I want to thank Columbia University's nursing and neurolo neurology departments, especially Dr. Richard Mayhew and G Dean uh, Judy Horning of the nursing department. Angelique, did you have a few housekeeping notes that you wanted to make? Okay. So we have a big agenda today with wonderful speakers, but first I want to let introduce to you Dr. Richard Mayhew of Columbia University. He is the Gertrude Sergevsky Professor of Neurology, Psychiatry, Epidemiology, Director of the Gertrude Sergevsky Center, Co-Director of the Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's and the Aging Brain, and the Chairman Department of Neurology and Neurologist-in-Chief at New York Hospital Presbyterian. Dr. Richard Mayhew's support of this event, the offering of this venue, has been invaluable to us as a community. We invite you to share a few words, Dr. Mayhew, um, about the inspiring honoree we have dedicated to this conference today. There we go. We're here to discuss a very interesting disorder. Uh, since I deal mostly with Alzheimer's disease, I seldom see pa patients with this uh, problem. Uh, but I know it's a serious problem, and in our department, uh, we've made a dedication to taking care of this problem. And today, you're going to hear from experts from around the world uh, to try to have a better understanding of this condition, which during my period of training uh, was thought to be maybe a psychiatric disorder, not a real disorder at all. We know now that it's triggered by streptococcal uh, infection uh, and an immune response. It's an, a type of inflammatory brain disorder. The symptoms you're all aware of, so I won't review those, What's striking to me is we still don't know how prevalent the condition is because the definition is still a little bit flexible. We also don't know how many children uh, develop the condition, although there's some estimates. These are probably not accurate because they don't re reflect the entire spectrum of disease. It's my hope, sincerely, that by the end of this conference today, we'll have a better understanding of both of these questions, which I think are important. Secondly, uh, I would like to just make uh, a suggestion that we dedicate this uh, meeting uh, to Arnold Gold. Arnold Gold was an internationally recognized child neurologist, and I'm sure he's seen this condition. Um, along with his wife, uh, Sandra Gold, uh, of the Gold Foundation, uh, they started the Gold Humanitism Honor Society and the so-called white coat ceremony that almost every medical school in the United States now, and actually some international schools, use to introduce students to uh, uh, their role. The importance of the uh, Gold Foundation is to make sure that physicians in training and, physici and all of us understand the importance of treating the individual as a person rather than a laboratory report. Arnold uh, trained me as a neurologist. I spent quite a bit of time uh, on, uh, during my career as a neurology resident on the Child Neurology Service. And he had a remarkable affiliation with children. When he would walk in the door, both the children and the parents would immediately have this magnetic uh, attachment to Arnold, and he to them. And the other characteristic, uh, about Arnold was that he brought out the best uh, from, of anyone that he had the privilege to work with. Uh, he seemed to recognize in everyone uh, who they were, what they were about, and of course, if he didn't know, he would ask, and he would, until you told him everything you wanted to tell him about yourself. So I hope uh, he's looking down upon this conference. I'm sure he will instill all of you uh, with the great 
amount of information you're going to hear today, and hopefully we can get a handle on this very complicated pr uh, problem. So I welcome you to Columbia. I hope you enjoy the conference today, and I look forward to hearing the talks. Thank you. The parents of Pandas Network have um, really appreciate your assistance with um, the families. Dr. Gold's, um, may I say, had a grandchild that had Pandas, and he reached out to me a long time ago, about nine years ago, and, and, and was very candid about being perplexed about the situation and was very open to understanding new things from a parent's perspective. So because we love you and appreciate you and Dr. Gold so much, we have a beautiful statue for you from um, Africa, Africa, where there's a lot of strep. This is a Well, this is an unexpected pleasure to just look at you all here. Um, Arnold was a cutting edge doctor. Uh, he knew that you never can know everything if you're a doctor and was respectful of that and actually diagnosed um, two of our grandchildren with PANDAS. And so um, I ask today that everyone here you're here with open minds and that you'll take the message and spread it because they're children who are suffering and parents who are suffering and, fam and families who are suffering. So let's learn a lot together. I'm so grateful to the Pandas Network and Diana and Angelique and the whole board who have worked very, very hard to make this day possible and uh, I'm praying for enlightenment. Before we begin the formal uh, lectures, we prepared something for you. Following is a brief video of me talking about the founding and purpose of Pandas Network and how the conference came to be. Our goal is to inform and inspire healing in children. Many of us, including my own children, were completely able to stop this syndrome, thank God, and um, no severe illness remains. We hope that the wonderful knowledge that we get from neuroscience will continue to develop from this conference. So the video is going to play. Pandas Network was formed in 2009. My son got Pandas in 2007. And I decided to put up a, a website to describe some of the research I'd read about strep-inducing psychiatric disorders in children. It was based on Sue Suido's research. And I thought it was such a rare disease that hardly anybody would hit on the website. And within uh, one month, there were 100 people who hit on the website describing in detail from diverse parts of the United States and the world exactly the same episode that was happening to their children. And that rate of 100 parents or inquiries per month hasn't stopped for 10 years. I grew up in a medical family. I was sketching by uh, bacterium and amoeba at the age of four and five with my dad over a microscope. And he really, um, I didn't go into medicine myself, but he really taught me that um, there's always an answer. The human body is trying to teach you uh, something through disease. So I was never terribly afraid of disease. In fact, I thought of it as more of an ally. and. Um, one of the things my father always used to say, he was a pediatrician and an internist, he would say, always trust the mother, trust what they say. And um, that's the opposite of what a lot of doctors say to our families. In the past decade, I've probably talked to about 4,000 people and answered about 12,000 inquiries um, because we've been able to stand the test of time. We now have support groups and other nonprofits across the United States and I think nationwide there's easily 20,000 cases. The community is helping each other. We're promoting the research the doctors have done. We understand that it's difficult to get new research out into the hands of doctors, especially in an illness that is stigmatized 
by mental incapacity. When my son was diagnosed with PANDAS, the term autoimmune encephalitis filled a medical journal this big of a paragraph. That was it. And uh, although there were sensory abnormalities, sudden onset of acute behavior changes, clearly encephalitic, I couldn't use that term. Thankfully, um, since that time, there's been a lot of research and identifying of antibodies that are occurring in autoimmune encephalitis. However, it was just about a month ago that the Mayo Clinic finally issued a report saying that there's probably 90,000 cases of autoimmune encephalitis per year worldwide that aren't being diagnosed based on the current antibodies discovered. They know there's dozens, if not hundreds, more antibodies. Therefore, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of more different kinds of autoimmune encephalopathies that are occurring worldwide. I think what will move the needle forward is if our community sticks together. Sociologists know that community is the beginning and basis of everything. If our community creates a patient registry, doctors from every field of science could look at our cases, um, neuro neurology, psychiatry, immunology, we have these cross currents of discovery and we need to give them a platform to look at our cases. We have a spectrum of illness. Some children are mild. Some children are acute. Some children that are mild lead to acute cases. There is no way for the medical community to understand how to move forward unless we present our cases as a whole. I think that um, in a decade, we're going to make great progress if we stay bonded together, articulating what's happening. And I want this, end, this illness to end in my lifetime. I, I don't want to think about it anymore. It needs to stop. And I think we can do it as a community. Pretty sure we can. <laughs> that was mildly excruciating for me, but thank you for listening. <laughs> OK. Um, what we're going to begin with today is a plenary roundtable discussion. It's a multidisciplinary exploration of the common threads among infectious triggered autoimmune diseases of the brain. So I'm going to re read all of the names of all of the speakers and what they do. You guys can begin to assemble if you'd like to the front of the panel. So um, speaking today will be Dr. Susan Suido, Chief Pediatrics, Developmental Neuroscience Branch of the NIMH. Michael Benrose, the fantastic senior researcher at Copenhagen University, um, All House University, Mental Health Center of Copenhagen, and the National Center for uh, Register-Based Research in Copenhagen, Denmark. Dr. Margot Tienemann, a California hero, co-director of the Stanford University PANS Clinic. She's a child and adolescent psychiatrist, specialist in OCD. The wonderful Dr. Sewell Najjar, Chair of Neurology, Lenox Hill Hospital, Staten Island University Hospital, and Chair of Professor Neurology of the Barbara and Donald Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Dr. Brian Fallon, Professor of Clinical Psychiatry, Columbia University, Director of the Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Research Center, Columbia University, where is she? Medical Center. And Dr. Tyler Con uh, Cutforth, so sorry, Associate Research Scientist, Department of Neurology, Columbia University Medical Center, Research Scientist with the Agayu Lab, Department of Neurology, Columbia. Thank you very much. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, Ms. Wallace and I talked yesterday, and so I know the first questions that she was going to ask, and I will ask it in her place. And we will um, just ask everybody to, maybe in reverse order, since I have the mic and I'll go last, is just to say uh, sort of what the common thread is that they have seen between the illnesses that we're discussing. So. Well, I'm not a clinician, so I don't have a disease. We have research, and actually, okay, is that working? How's that? 
I'll just speak loud. We have to turn our conversation. Oh, one at a time? Is that? I'm talking. Is that? OK. OK. Um, right, so we, our lab, and you're going to hear more about this. Uh, my husband and I, Dritan Nagali, run a lab at Columbia here. And we're basic scientists. We work mainly on mouse models of what we are now calling, after the NIH told us we have to refer to it that way, is post-infectious basal ganglia encephalitis. So that encompasses, in our minds, um, pandas as well as Sydenham's chorea, which is not a controversial disease at all. And I think, and we're, I'm going to touch on this a little bit, but there's some overlap with them. The first cases arose from a cohort of children who have Sydenham. So, and and the more we, we've been working on this for a few years now, like learning more about also NMDA encephalitis, other ones. We're just We think it's going to help everybody move forward mechanistically and research-wise to sort of think more broadly, and that's, I think, what this conference is all about. Okay, my name is Brian Fallon, and uh, early in the 1990s, I became interested in Lyme disease. Uh, prior to that, I was heavily focused on obsessive-compulsive disorder and uh, hypochondriasis, I continued that work on OCD and hypochondriasis, but I got more and more involved in Lyme disease because Lyme disease uh, seemed to be associated with certain neuropsychiatric symptoms, which included things like cognitive problems, mood disorders, and rarely um, psychotic presentations or mania, at least this was reported in Europe. And so we became interested in studying this. And along the way, in studying it, I realized that Lyme disease is a very complicated illness. Uh, it's an illness complicated both by the spirochete and both by the and by the host response. Uh, and then in the mid-90s, I became head of the Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Research Center here at Columbia. And we're, we're committed to trying to understand why patients have chronic symptoms, and in particular, to try to understand the neuropsychiatric aspects of it. Good morning. Uh, my name is Suen Najjar. Uh, I'm trained as a neuropathologist, and after four years of neuropathology, I ended up doing neurology. And my interest was derived from actually doing post-mortem uh, analysis on people who commit suicide and others who have major depressive disorders with no obvious neurological illness. And back then, I was seeing a tremendous amount of uh, what we refer to microglia activation, which is activation of intrinsic immune cells in the brain. In people who never had infections, never had neurological symptoms, but had major disabling psychiatric illnesses. And there was no explanation. And when I asked my uh, attendings and my chairman, God bless his soul, Dr. Barron, what the relevance of microglia activation in those disorders back then did not make any sense, to the point we did not even include this finding in our post-mortem uh, report. Indeed, uh, later on when I did the epilepsy and we were looking at the epileptic tissue in people who have refractory epilepsy, we, especially those who have comorbid psychiatric illness, we find higher density of these cells in the brain. Again, that finding never made it to the report of the resected epileptic tissue pathology report until basically I pushed the envelope because I really believe inflammation and immunological process can lead to psychiatric illness. And that the concept, I worked on it for 20 years, and now as the chair, I do clinical translational re research focusing on the link of autoimmunity and inflammation to acute neuropsychiatric disorders in general to include autoimmune encephalitis. Thank you. Hi, I'm Margot Tienemann. I started my work uh, training in internal medicine and flirted with a fellowship in rheumatology. But then I got really worried about the patients that were being so dismissed because they had uh, psychiatric complaints. So I decided to be a psychiatrist and in the process thought, well, I want to get closer to the trouble when it starts. So I decided to be a child psychiatrist. And I, uh, like Brian, had an OCD clinic. 
and I wanted to get even closer to the start. I read about Sue's work and uh, started noticing that there were kids in my practice who had a sudden onset of OCD, and looking further, they had had infections. When I started training in psychiatry, it was debated whether you should even allow people to take antidepressant medicine because you might uh, deprive them of having insight into their troubles and how they might be thinking and feeling and processing things wrong. Psychiatry really unzipped from medicine in, a, I don't think, a very good way at all. But I think what's thrilling to me is I think we need to zip back t together and um, become the real doctors we were. I mean that in a sillyish way and not uh, trained to be. And that when behavior changes happen and emotional changes, to look back at the, the physical milieu in which it happens. Yes. And my name is uh, Michael Eriksson Binras, and I'm a medical doctor and an adult psychiatrist. And I actually came into this uh, field by studying cancer research, where we did a, a study that some of the first symptoms of uh, undetected cancer could actually be psychiatric symptoms due to inflammation or pyroplastic antibodies. And then I went on to read some of uh, your work about the pandas, which led me into the field that I'm in now, studying uh, inflammation and infections and their associations with uh, mental disorders particularly, but also some neuro neurological disorders. And in Denmark, we have a specific system, so we can follow all the, all the Danish population with a, every time they go to the hospital, or every time they have a prescription of a medicine, and every time they have a lab test, this is recorded on registers. So we can take advantage for this to study the longitudinal associations between different exposures, uh, such as infections and autoimmune diseases, with a large panel of uh, mental disorders, but also specific biomarkers and uh, genetic tests. So I strive to and we also have clinical studies with CSF studies of patients with new onset uh, mood disorders and schizophrenia, where we try to identify immune related subgroups that run across these uh, uh, mental disorders. So, and I very much uh, agree that uh, it's time to bridge psychiatry with the rest of medicine and uh, neurology, which I think is the, the way forward. Good morning, I'm Sue Sweeto from the National Institute of Mental Health, and I came to the NIMH um, in 1986 out of a pediatric intensive care unit program, and Henrietta Leonard and I started the same day. She was the brains, because she was the child psychiatrist, and I was the hands, because I could put the art lines in and do the spinal taps. And we both had the great fortune to work for Judy Rappaport, um, just a very forward-thinking child psychiatrist who really understood, even at the time that others thought OCD was punitive toilet training, that this was a brain-based disorder. And because I was the pediatrician, I was in charge of looking at the uh, relationship between Sydenham Korea, the neurologic manifestation of acute rheumatic fever, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And indeed, it turned out that post-streptococcal OCD has a very unique presentation, uh, but our first report didn't come out until 1995, and it actually discussed post-infectious obsessive compulsive disorder with acute onset. Because we had seen cases after influenza, after uh, varicella, and more recently, we now know that it can also be triggered by mycoplasma. So I love the fact that uh, the NIH is telling uh, Tyler and, and Dr. Agaliu in order to get their grant, we have to call this post-infectious basal ganglia encephalitis because that's indeed what it is. And, and we'll be moving in that direction. And, and I asked everybody to talk about the common threads. I think we did that because the bottom line is that these acute and subacute onset syndromes, even if it's a behavioral presentation, it represents neuroinflammation and we need to figure out the cause and the best treatment for that. Um, I think we've done a really good job with uh, sort of the classic case of pandas, so now it's time to move out into that larger group of patients that are just described as PANS or pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, because that makes no assumptions about the cause or the disease mechanism. It's just the unique features of that clinical presentation. 
And I'm not sure that immunotherapy is the best thing for all of those children. There may be something else, and we need to figure out what that is. Thank you. And now, Ms. Wallace has joined us. Still dead. Yeah, you're still right now. I'll start over. Good morning, everybody. I'm Claudia Wallace. I am a medical journalist. I write for Scientific American and uh, was formerly the uh, managing editor of Scientific American Mind. I'm very happy to be here, and I want to apologize for my uh, late arrival. It was ugly traffic out there. Um, Thank you for the panel for getting things rolling. Um, I, I think you may have anticipated my first questions, but before we go any further, I, I just I think it could be helpful to know who's in the audience today. How many of you are in clinical practice? Almost everybody. How many of you are in neurology? How many of you are in psychiatry? How many in immunology? Just a few. And others. <laughs> And any nurses out there? Very good. Uh, how many are you, are you, are you are in research? Quite a few. Any students out there? OK, good. Welcome, everybody. Um, so that can, might help us know how to orient you know, mostly clinical people, uh, but a really great mix. Um, as you've already heard, um, we're bringing together three separate that three fields that have been quite separate, immunology, psychiatry, and neurology, to look for common threads. And uh, the particular disorders that we're looking at today really require that kind of multidisciplinary focus. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that we thought the brain was just this immunoprotected region. And more recently, we've seen there's a very complex crosstalk between the immun immunological system and the central nervous system, and that things can go awry. So I was going to ask the panel to first say a few things about why, what has led us to this reassessment, what are some of the most important evidence that has come out in recent years to, that, that is shedding light on these new diseases, but also that's showing us this crosstalk. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I can start with highlighting some of, some of our Danish studies where we have uh, in a large scale showed that there are clearly significant associations between different immune exposures with uh, mental disorders and also child psychiatric uh, disorders. And uh, I think they have uh, paved the way for showing that this association is uh, real and uh, they are in large scale data. And then I think there's also coming uh, out these new interesting studies uh, with uh, Najjar that uh, these people with autoimmune encephalitis actually have very good uh, effects of immunotherapy, which have re really uh, run around the, the world and are recognized by all fields. And also that inflammation is being a bigger, bigger part of virtually all medical diseases and also now mental disorders. And we're showing the first uh, signs that anti-inflammatory treatment can actually also have some effects, at least at uh, patients with a depression. We have shown that in a meta-analysis uh, ourselves. So I think all this uh, evidence is uh, going in that direction and also, yeah, leading the field forward. Um, I just want to remi excuse me, remind all of you about neurosyphilis and how up until the 1950s, 1960s, uh, infectious causes of mental illness were actually by far the leading cause. And it wasn't just the syphilis spirochete, it was the neuroinflammation caused by that uh, bacteria. So the notion of sort of infectious or post-infectious psychiatric symptoms goes way back um, a very, very long time. And I think the key, and it's easier for us in child psychiatry than for the adults, 
is to link the inciting infection with that psychiatric manifestation. Uh, some of my colleagues are trying to do the research on childhood exposures to viruses and bacteria, then uh, predisposing you to myocarditis or um, actual myocardial infarction and heart disease as an adult. So this relationship between sort of inflammation and later symptomatology, I think, is becoming more widespread and well known. And again, as I mentioned, we need to be expanding our focus so that I think if I had my way, before a child was hospitalized in a psychiatric unit, they would have a complete medical evaluation, even if their symptoms were simple psychosis or simple anxiety disorders. Thank you, Susan. I agree with every speaker here, uh, but here's my take on it. You know, for more than 50 years, we know from animal and human studies that there's significant overlap between psychiatric illnesses and pathological processes involving inflammation and immunological abnormalities. With the recent discoveries of antibody directed against neuronal and synaptic uh, proteins, such as anti-NMD receptor encephalitis, these studies provide direct link of immunological cause in terms of etiology to psychiatric illnesses. And to emphasize that, I mean, it's a different kind of objective. Was the child going to school? Was the parent able to go to work? Was the parent able to sleep alone? Was the child able to get out of the bathroom? You know, was the child able to eat? I mean, these are yes, no questions often and so dramatic uh, that I, it, it is objective in a different kind of way. And that's a very frustrating thing for many, many families because they will be saying it and saying it and tearing their hair out and, and knocking on many doors of many uh, uh, health care healthcare providers to say, well, we don't really have an objective measure yet. Um, but these are, are very real uh, objective things that are happening in the people's lives. My child is seeing things around. Uh, it's, it's not easy to measure. Just a, a pragmatic question. I mean, given that it can be so difficult to diagnose and given that um, the categorization of these illnesses is still pretty being worked out, let's put it that way, um, what happens to families seeking treatment, let's say in the case of PANDAS, in terms of getting insurance coverage for, for treatment? Oh, yes, we have some families in the audience. <laughs> so it's better today than it was, even two years ago. Um, but it's, it's woefully um, short of what it should be. And I think that's one of the reasons that I'm so glad everybody on the panel has said exactly the same thing. Do the medical workup. Don't put the child on the psychiatric, psychological, let's not even call it psychiatric, psychological side where they could be treated just as easily by a, a PhD behavior therapist as they could by a physician. Think of them as a mental neurologic disorder, and if you start from that uh, avenue, it's much easier to get them paid for because there are actually ICD codes of neuroinflammation not otherwise specified, autoimmune encephalitis not otherwise specified. And so within those umbrellas, we can fit pretty much every one of our patients. Now the bigger problem becomes that those children, to get that history, to do that uh, medical evaluation, is very time consuming. And so a lot of that time isn't currently compensated under our, our medical system today. Um, that's one good thing about being pediatricians, you usually don't expect to get paid, <laughs> but, but uh, the hospitals do, so uh, if they're doing the appropriate diagnostic workup, they actually should be able to get the coverage. And insurance companies, there are now enough precedent cases uh, that you can appeal, and, and the insurance companies count on you failing that first appeal. So what you literally do is you get the expert, and uh, in my talk this afternoon, I'll put the resource up. We literally, at the NIMH, are happy to review cases and to help you make that diagnosis as long as in, you're send, any patient that you send us 
you need to be prepared for us to say, wow, that is not Pan's Pandas. You need to look harder for something else. I don't, I'd like to raise the question of risk factors. Um, what, what do we know about genetic vulnerabilities and any other vulnerabilities that might make uh, one person more vulnerable to these sort of, uh, to these autoimmune um, diseases of the brain? Uh, for example, other auto, uh, you know, comorbid autoimmune diseases, but I'd like to, the whole range from history to genetics, what do we know? So we're actually gonna have a talk um, by three of our colleagues later this morning on the genetic risk factors. I think that um, Dr. Mady Hornick from here at Columbia has said it so beautifully that, the, that it's a triad of risk factors here where you have genetic familial factors, you have environmental exposure, and then you probably also have developmental factors. It's not an accident this, that this is happening to this aged child. And it's either because of the timing of the exposure to these common infections, or it may actually be because the developing brain is expressing different antigens than it's going to in a more mature state. So those are some of the really fascinating research questions. The practical matter is, if you, as you've already heard, if you have a family history of autoimmune disorder, a grandparent generation rheumatic fever, and uh, particularly rheumatic fever with Sydenham Korea, then and you have the rest of the diagnostic uh, features of the illness, then that's what your risk factors are. So familial, the wrong, unfortunate child, wrong bug at the wrong time. You know, one thing yes, I don't ahead. know about, I'm sorry, want to go? Okay, one thing I don't know about strep is whether there are strain variants okay. in strep because, the yeah. Go ahead. Nobody knows anything genetic why. I mean, as far as current state of the art. Here, take mine. It, it's an on now. There we go. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing a genetic study. We have some genes coming out now, and some other groups are too, and eventually we'll all talk to each other. You, and I'm trying to, I'm a geneticist by background, so I'm, I'm the one who's pushing this project here at Columbia, and, and we've got a great team, and we're not, we can't, we have nothing to talk about yet because we need to validate it. But if, just to let you know the state of the art, I'm going to psychiatric genetics conferences. Schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, these, these are all, they, they've scraped the bottom of the barrel and they need tens of thousands of patients. If to just a GWAS, that's sort of hypothesis free. There's other whole exome, which is what we're doing because we're not gonna have those kinds of patients, especially with the diagnostic issues. So, you know, we have now a nice cohort from Children's Hospital in Philadelphia rigorously, rigorously screened and it's 45 kids and, you know, Tanya's part of our thing and you're like, it's the di from, from my non-clinical thing where your data have to be as clean as possible, I, I, and I know how complicated this diagnosis is and there are no biomarkers, scans as we just heard, so, the, you know, the, the messy, and there's so much overlap with everything, so, that's just my perspective where, you know, on, on the, the overlap. Oh. I mean, I'm, again, this There's, is There is no overlap. If you are sticking to the criteria, I think the place we get overlap is when people blur the edges and, oh, Maybe. it wasn't overnight onset. It came on over uh. a two-month period, but that was acute because it interfered so with the family. So is comorbidity the better word? I, I think overlap is fine in terms okay. of. I mean, oh, this is just okay, a subclass of patients. Class, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to look the same as some others, and yet different. And I think that you're exactly right with the newer techniques like whole exome, whole genome, and the Stanford group already has findings yeah. uh, in the immune system, and we have findings in uh, the HLA subgroups as well. So. Fortunately, there is something quite unique about the children who are vulnerable, going back to the question about risk factors. And I guess I, was, I only got my dander up because you said there were no biomarkers. We actually do well, have biomarkers. Yes. And if you look at the cohort as a whole, if they fully meet oh. PANS, PANDAS uh, criteria, they will have an abnormality on MRI, EEG, sleep study, CSF, or uh, blood. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm coming as a basic sign. So biomarker to me is a protein, something I can see. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, from, from, uh, just from, go ahead. From, from the Lyme disease perspective, and we know that there are strain variations in the spirochetes. So depending on what kind of strain or genome species you have, you might have a somewhat different clinical uh, presentation. You might have a somewhat different clinical response. We know that there are host differences, so in terms of genetically. Certainly with HLA, DR2, DR4, that predisposes you to have, more likely to have Lyme arthritis. And Alan Steer's group at Harvard has shown that uh, patients, who, a subgroup of patients who present with uh, Lyme arthritis go on to develop other autoimmune arthritides. So we know that there are certainly host variables that contribute to how you respond to the pathogen. And so the same, presumably, is going to be true with strep and other infections. I agree with everybody, but I just make comment on Dr. Oswido because I do agree with her. The problems with the genetics, you're like what you said, you have to have a specific, well-defined clinical phenotyping. Band is a problem, the debate generated by that diagnosis, we created, because some of that term being abused, a lot of patients do not meet the criteria as well uh, this, uh, defined by Dr. Swedo. So you get those chronic insidious onset of some kind of psychiatric symptoms, and then people want to label it as pandas. And that created the debate and gave heterogeneity. As the syndrome described by Dr. Swedo, very specific clinical phenotyping. If we stick to that, then likely you're gonna find particular genetic abnormality. The other things that I wanna mention, yes, genetic, with neurology in general, we believe the combination of environmental and genetic factors. But to go, to, to, uh, to add more to the controversy, early on when anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis is described, I don't think anybody doubt that those antibodies are pathogenic, and we all believed in it, there no controversy, no debate about it. Having said that, are you aware that anti-NMD receptor antibody that causes encephalitis present in some of us in this room without encephalitis? So are they then pathogenic or not? Or in certain group pathogenic and others not? What other factors? And we refer to sometimes environmental factor. I want to know what they are those environmental factors. The bulk of them actually poorly defined infections that potentially can open a blood-brain barrier and allow those circulating antibodies that now they're not harmful because they have no access to the brain. But when you open the blood-brain barrier by infection, those antibodies in the blood now have access to the brain and cause inflammation and syndrome. What we know about it? In the past, when we treat patients with anti nmd receptor encephalitis, we were aiming to make, to, to, to make them seronegative, to switch from seropositive to seronegative. Now that our patient fully recovered, they still have antibody in the blood, I don't chase it anymore. And they are no longer sick. So it's a very complicated, so even for those disorders that there's no controversy about it, those antibodies found in, uh, repeatedly now in healthy individuals. So we have to be really careful. Define the clinical phenotype, define the pathogen, define the mechanism, and come up with the biomarkers to monitor disease risk activity. Those four things are important. But life is, is not that simple. Sometimes you find only two out of four. We will take what we can get for now. We, we are almost out of time, and um, there's so many more questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to so, so many of them. I, I think that we may have time for one more and um, I'm wondering if the audience would rather hear about treatment, with which we haven't really discussed, or would we rather talk about what are the big remaining, what's the next thing we need to do to tackle this constellation of, uh, of illnesses? Do you want to hear about treatment? Because we really haven't touched on it. OK, it's clinicians in the audience. Let's, how do we treat these diseases? So the treatment depends on the presentation and the underlying disease mechanism. In I'll speak only to pandas because that's what my experience is. We can talk about the others. And it has to be threefold approach, uh, just as you would for uh, pneumonia in an asthmatic child. So you need to treat the source of the problem. In this case, use antibiotics. And the second line of tra treatment is immunomodulatory uh, treatments such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, steroids, IVIG, plasmapheresis, and lots and lots of specialized treatments like rituximab. 
And then the third, and in my mind, actually most important, is the symptom relief. And that is provided by a combination of traditional uh, psychiatric medications and behavior therapy. And the children that I had the privilege of taking care of back in 86 to 92, uh, who we were incredibly aggressive with the antibiotic prophylaxis and treated their acute onset of OCD, which sometimes last for a year, two, two or even three or four years, with medications and behavior therapy, those young adults and some now not so young adults are doing extraordinarily well without adult illness. So I would just beg clinicians to get them to that psychologist, get them to the psychiatrist who can give the specialized medicine, convince your infectious disease colleagues that uh, using antibiotics here makes as much sense as somebody told me this morning uh, in that kid pulling at his ear who you can't really see the drum because of the wax, you're still gonna give antibiotics, do it in our kids as well. Yes, and I can of course uh, mainly speak for adult psychiatry, but there we, uh, when the patient are admitted as I described, we do a thorough diagnostic uh, workout, and if we find uh, if infections, of course, they are treated, or if we find uh, autoantibodies, they are also treated. So if we find uh, uh, the biological cause due to the diagnostic evaluation, we treat that uh, underlying cause with uh, antibiotics or immunotherapy, but otherwise they have a standard uh, psychiatric treatment. So that is the current state of that. And I think regarding the autoimmune encephalitis, uh, if we're in doubt, we take uh, CSF tests. And if there's no elevated cells, then we doesn't proceed. But if the cells are elevated, we do uh, the autoantibodies uh, and for infections also. And then uh, we might miss a smaller group that uh, doesn't have elevated cells, but that is the guidelines uh, in Denmark at least. Do you want to add something? Yeah. I would just add to what Sue said, that. A lion, the lion's share of the work I found has to be done with the parents. The children are really sick, and they may not be available for a while to have some sort of psychotherapy. And I have not been overwhelmed by the help of psychotropic medication. I think teaching the parents as much as possible how to deal with the anxiety, how to deal with the OCD, how to deal with the schools, how to deal with other health practitioners uh, has been I could think the, the bulk of the work I felt that's been helpful, especially acutely. So do you have a sense that they are less responsive to psychotropic meds than, let's say, a child with OCD not related to PANS? I'm glad you asked me if I had a sense, because <laughs> that's how I'd like to answer. Uh, I think they can, are much more susceptible, in my experience, to side effects that can mimic anxiety and, uh, and the other upsets of, of PANS. So, Personally, this is just me. <laughs> I don't like to treat them with uh, SSRIs, antipsychotics, if I can help it acutely. <laughs> but we will use things like uh, benzodiazepines, clonidine, guanfacine, uh, Benadryl, gabapentin, to try to help them get to their MRIs and have in their blood drawn and go to sleep at night. I think we should thank the panel. We're, we're out of time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia, very much for your moderating.